So anyway, I, first off, I just wanted to say welcome. Uh, it looks like we got 34 people. So again, another month, uh, even though we're virtual, we got some pretty good attendance. And I appreciate everyone coming. Um, I hope everyone is well and you know, surviving through this thing and making the best of everything that's going on. In terms of when do we stop being virtual and when might we start being in person again, that's still kind of on hold. Um, still obviously gonna have to uh, adapt to whatever the gardens do. Um, but we did, uh, we had a board meeting uh, two Sundays ago. A couple of good things came out of that. I think we got the year kind of sketched out. Um, for some of you that had indicated in, in the survey we put out, we are gonna have a, a beginning bonsai class. Uh, that we're gonna start up again, obviously subject to when people can get together and do that kind of work, but we wanna get that going because there was uh, some demand for that from, from members. Um, Tom is going to, in a moment, going to talk about a uh, short view of the program. We've got some really good programs lined up, and I think virtually it's going to be uh, really nice. Um, you know, we're still trying to figure out how we do some of the things that we like to do in terms of, for instance, repriving workshops and so forth and do that uh, virtually or not. The um, Nicholas, who is on here, we're going to try something new this year. Nicholas is going to be setting up a uh, an online auction and hopefully, hopefully that'll be via Zoom. And we'll try to do what we usually do at, uh, for instance, at the annual show. It's an experiment, see how successful it will be. But I think if, you know, we have this kind of participation, it could probably be a lot of fun and uh, be a good uh, fundraising event. And also a good opportunity for people to pick up new things to play with bonsai wise. And then Daryl Whitley is going to be working. He's the show chair this year. And we are um, anticipating that we're going to have a virtual show again. Probably not exactly like the last one. But one of the things that we do intend to do is publish the pictures of our trees. So again, I would encourage you if you have uh, trees that are best presented in spring, flowering trees and so forth, please take photos of those. Uh, so that we're able to show those kind of trees in our show as well, since it will be virtual and uh, doesn't necessarily have to be at the gardens when it uh, is photographed. And we are optimistically planning for an in-person show at the Botanic Gardens. That will be the first weekend in September. And you know, if, we're, if we are able to do that, it will be the typical show that we've usually put on. So of course, you know, we'll be ramping up and, and meeting those people of all the members as we have in the past to get that show up and, and going. So I think we've got a pretty good year lined out, um, subject to some of the things that happened with COVID. But I'm optimistic that as the year goes forward, we're going to be able to open up and do some things that um, people have been asking for. I think at this point, I will turn it over to Tom. Uh, Tom is going to kind of give you a really quick snapshot of the kind of what's coming up in programs. So what you can expect here. And he's going to introduce uh, Bjorn for us, and then we'll get on with uh, Bjorn's uh, presentation. So, Tom, over to you. Now I'm live. Um, so, uh, we've got uh, programs uh, planned basically for the first half of the year uh, for all of you who are interested. Um, obviously, tonight we're very, very fortunate to have with us uh, Bjorn Bjorholm, uh, who is. Uh, um, well, I'll talk more about him in a minute. But anyway, in uh, next next month in March, uh, I will be doing a presentation on uh, repotting bonsai, uh, which is something that uh, Adam Johnson and I have done for in the uh, early part of the spring for the last several years. Uh, Adam is really, really preoccupied with his business interests right now. Uh, so I'll be doing it solo. Uh, but uh, I, I'm hopefully going to be able to uh, present some good information and techniques about uh, repotting bonsai and some of the things to, uh, to, to, to do and not do and, and to look out for. So that's March. And then in April, we'll be joined by a gentleman named Sergio Kwan. Sergio comes to us from the eastern part of the United States, uh, and he'll be making a presentation about deciduous trees and we don't often uh, hear uh, 
presentations about deciduous trees because we're so focused on conifers, but uh, that is Sergio's specialty and he is very enthusiastic about joining us and, and uh, uh, doing a presentation on deciduous. And Sergio is again, one of those uh, young upcoming uh, bonsai artists in the United States. So uh, I'm very interested to hear what he has to say and, and he's very happy to be joining us. Um, and so that's April. In May, uh, our own uh, uh, Scott Sch uh, Schlafer will be uh, doing a presentation and demo uh, for our meeting in, in May. I have yet to hear what, what he's going to be working on, but I'm sure it'll probably be a, a conifer of some sorts. And, uh, and we all enjoy uh, hearing from Scott, or from Todd, I'm sorry, uh, and uh, what he has to say. Uh, so that's May. And then June, I just uh, secured a, a commitment from uh, Jerry Meislick, who is probably one of the uh, foremost experts on tropical trees as bonsai. And Jerry's going to be making a presentation focused primarily on ficus as a species. Um, he just published a new book on ficus. And so he's going to be doing the presentation in June, on June 1st, I believe. He, uh, he's also made an offer to us, if any of you are interested, uh, to purchase, pre-purchase his book, uh, which is, uh, uh, he, he did a, pre a pre previous book, but this one is, uh, is bigger and more uh, extensive. And uh, uh, it's going to be available to the club if we, uh, have at least five orders of the book um, for $30 a head and uh, signed by him with, uh, and that includes shipping. So uh, it's a pretty good deal actually. And I've did, I did a little bit of a preview of the book and it, it looks like it's a, it's a really nice book to have. So, uh, so that's June and I'm working on the second part of the year. Uh, but I think we've got some interesting possibilities there. So, so that's, uh, that's from now until the middle of the year. So tonight we have with us uh, Bjorn Bjorholm. Uh, Bjorn is, uh, is without, without uh, any uh, reservation, uh, one of the best uh, bonsai artists we have in the country and he's a good teacher as well. And uh, some of us had the opportunity uh, literally uh, a year ago uh, to go to Japan with Bjorn and his lovely wife, Nancy, uh, to do some touring, visiting bonsai nurseries. And also uh, the primary purpose was to visit uh, the Kokofu exhibition, Kokofu and exhibition in Tokyo. And uh, we had a great time. And, my only reservation is that the trip was too short, uh, but uh, um, it, it was a it was a it was a wonderful experience to to uh, to see all of these sites and especially the exhibition uh, with Bjorn. Um, to give you a little background, some of you, many of you, probably know Bjorn because he's been with us in person at the Rocky Mountain Bonsai Society on several occasions now, made presentations to the, to the club and had some workshops. And I think Bjorn's workshops have been some of the best workshops that we've had uh, because he has uh, an incredible uh, uh, enthusiasm and is willing to work with everybody, uh, whatever kind of tree they have available. And, uh, and something good always comes out of it. So, uh, but to give you a little background for, for those of you who may not be as familiar with Bjorn, uh, Bjorn uh, spent six years as an apprentice in Japan, uh, working with um, uh, bonsai master uh, Keiichi Fujikawa at uh, his nursery, which we visited when we were in Japan, uh, the Kukaen bonsai nursery in, in Osaka. And uh, after his com the completion of his apprentice, uh, he uh, 
became, he received certification in, in Japan uh, from the Nippon Bonsai Association, which is a very big deal for anybody who's coming to uh, that country from another place. So I think if I'm not mistaken, I believe that Bjorn is the only uh, American uh, bonsai artist who has that level of certification in Japan. As a result of that, he spent another couple of years working with uh, Fujikawa-san uh, at the nursery there as a bonsai professional. So he spent, I believe, a total of eight years in Japan. Uh, and during that uh, course of, of action um, or of activity, uh, he also met his wife, who is a, a wonderful person that we also had an opportunity to meet uh, on the Japan tour. And uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, the two of them are now uh, be, uh, expecting to become parents of, uh, of a young uh, little girl. So um, uh, we, we were very pleased to, uh, to wish him our, our best and congratulations in that regard. Bjorn owns in Tennessee, outside of uh, Nashville, uh, his own garden now, uh, which is called ACN. And uh, uh, Bjorn can probably tell you a bit more about what that word means in, in Japanese, but uh, he is uh, uh, doing classes and doing online instruction and uh, is certainly, as I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the premier uh, uh, bonsai artists in the United States and has traveled internationally extensively uh, to do uh, demonstrations and workshops in other parts of the world. And uh, so we really can't wait uh, to get him back uh, to Colorado in person uh, to work with him once again. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll stop my, my uh, my introduction and uh, extend a warm welcome to uh, Bjorn Bjorholm. Okay, all right, I'll take over here. Thanks, Tom. Uh, first off, thanks for inviting me back uh, to do this again. I know that uh, unfortunately we can't do it in person this time, but hopefully the information that I'll provide this time around through the demo will be useful to you guys and understandable in this format as well. Uh, one, one thing I want to correct Tom on real quick is I'm not the only American who has a certification at this point. There are a couple others who have received it recently as well, uh, including uh, Matt Reel and Tyler Sherrod as well. So definitely want to give those guys props too for having completed an apprentice. Um, so the demonstration tonight, the subject is going to be about uh, broadleaf evergreen and uh, deciduous trees. Um, so I've put together a 45 minute uh, video uh, and basically the way the video is set up is we cover the basic maintenance schedule from spring through the summer and into fall. So it's three separate sections. Each section is about 15 minutes. Uh, so what we'll do after each section, I'll stop the video uh, and then we can do a Q&A and you guys can either ask the questions, I guess, via the chat um, or uh, you could speak up and just ask them directly to me over the video chat as well. Um, so if you guys are okay with it, uh, just go ahead and mute yourselves for this point. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Hey guys, welcome back to a brand new episode. This time around, we're going to be talking about everything broadleaf evergreen and deciduous trees. In specific, we're going to be essentially making a maintenance schedule that starts out in the spring, goes through summer, and ends in fall so that you guys can keep these species on track throughout the growing season and keep them progressing forward year after year after year. Now, before we actually get into the maintenance schedule for the year, what I want to do is give you guys some basic information, some kind of horticultural information about the plants that we're going to be working with. Now, of course, we've got broadleaf evergreen on one side. These are going to be species like Kuchinashi, which is gardenia, or Eliagnus, which would be a silverberry. On the flip side, with our deciduous trees, of course, these are plants that lose their leaves in the fall through a process called abscission. So these would be things like your maples, your hornbeams, your beech, and a whole plethora of other species. Now, regardless of whether or not the species that you're working with is a broadleaf evergreen or a deciduous tree, you're going to run across essentially two basic leaf patterns or phyllotaxy 
on those trees. First and foremost, you're going to see opposite leaf pattern trees. These would be trees like maples, for example, where in the spring, as the new shoot emerges, you have two leaves opposite of one another on each side of that shoot, and they'll continue down the length of that shoot. On the flip side of that, you have alternating leaf pattern trees. These are plants like stewardia, flowering apricot, hornbeam, beech. As a matter of fact, the majority of the trees that you work with are going to be alternating leaf pattern trees. And of course, these are plants that if you look at the shoot, the leaves and buds actually alternate down the length of those shoots. So it's good to know this information to begin with here because it has implications for how we prune these species later in the growing season. So definitely put that in the memory bank for now. Now again, my goal in this episode is to give you a basic maintenance schedule throughout the entire growing season to keep your trees on track. So we're not necessarily going to dive deeply into specific techniques, but I am going to give you that schedule that you can follow so you can keep your trees on track going forward and into the future as well. So without further ado, let's jump into the very first section here, and that is going to be spring maintenance schedule for your broadleaf evergreen and deciduous trees. Okay, so first things first here, let's talk about repotting in spring. A vast majority of the species that you're gonna be working with in both of these categories here, we're gonna repot just before or just as the new buds start to swell in the spring. Now this is going to shift a little bit depending on the species and the age of the tree as to the exact timing, but as a general rule of thumb, early spring, as the buds start moving, is perfect timing to do it. Now, specifically when we're dealing with older trees and in particular when we're dealing with older Japanese maples, for example, I would recommend that you actually wait a little bit later into the spring season after the new buds have actually popped open and you start to see a little bit of that fleshy growth starting to emerge from those buds before you repot. The reason being is that if you repot an older Japanese maple too early in spring, say before the buds move or just as the buds start to swell, quite often because those trees tend to be somewhat weak as they get older, those trees will actually shed older branches or interior branches. So in other words, those branches on the interior of the plant that are weaker may not fully open later in the spring and they may die off in favor of the external growth on the plant. So you definitely want to be careful when you're dealing with older Japanese maples. Now, when I say older Japanese maples, we're talking, you know, 35, 40 plus years old. So I would imagine that a majority of the plants that you guys are working with are going to be much younger material. So I wouldn't worry about doing the early spring repotting just before or just as the buds start to swell. Now, in terms of the soil that I use for most of my deciduous trees, it's going to be essentially a 50% Akadama, 25% Lava Rock, 25% Pumice Mix. The Akadama Akadama, of course, holds a lot of moisture. It also retains some fertilizer as well because it does have cation exchange within the soil. So with our deciduous trees, they tend to prefer a little bit more of a moist soil than our conifers, for example. So that's why I use 50% Akadama. The pumice at a 25% rate, pumice will provide some aeration and some drainage, but it also does hold some moisture. And then the lava rock is going to be your most free draining component within the soil. So 50, 25, 25, or 211 works quite well for our deciduous trees. Now, keep in mind here in Nashville, we are very humid here in the summer, so that mix works quite well for us. If you happen to live in a much more arid environment, you may want to be putting in more Akadama and maybe even more pumice as well into the soil to hold more moisture. If you're living in a much wetter environment, you may want to use less Akadama, maybe a one-to-one-to-one -one -to -one -to -one mix, like a conifer mix almost, for your broadleaf evergreen and deciduous tree. So you're just going to have to adjust a little bit based on your particular environment. All right, next up, let's talk about growth maintenance in the spring. So what I wanna do here to begin with is talk a bit about hormone exchange within your plants, and that'll give you a better idea as to how to prune or why we prune in certain ways. So first and foremost, first thing in the spring, as the new growth is starting to emerge on your trees, the terminal shoots, or those new shoots that are starting to emerge and elongate, in the tips of each of those shoots, there's a growth hormone called auxin. This hormone is actually going to be transported back down through the tree via a process called polar auxin transport down to the root system of the tree. Once it gets to the root system, it's going to interact with another hormone called cytokinin, which is also actually being transported up through the tree to the shoots. So this hormonal exchange going up and down through the plant of the auxin going down to the roots and of the cytokinin going up to the shoots is something called crosstalk. It happens with all of your trees. As a matter of fact, everything from your conifers to your broadleaf evergreen to your deciduous trees. So in the early spring, if we're going through and removing that new growth, those new terminal shoots that are coming out, you're removing that native auxin from those tips and it is no longer able to transport down through the tree to the roots. So you're not gonna have very good root growth and you're not gonna have very good subsequent top growth on the tree. 
So as a general rule of thumb, with the vast majority, almost all of the broadleaf evergreen and deciduous trees, and as a matter of fact, with most of your coniferous material as well, the moral of the story here is in spring, just allow everything to elongate and grow. Now you may be asking yourself, what about like Japanese maple, for example? I heard you're supposed to pinch out the center shoot as it starts to emerge in early spring. Well, it depends on the stage of development of the tree and it also depends on the health of the plant. So for example, if you're dealing with a younger Japanese maple and you're trying to pump up the size of the trunk, maybe you're trying to get it a little bit larger or you're trying to grow out the length of a branch or thicken a branch, you're going to want to leave all of those terminal shoots intact in the early spring. You're in early stages of development. There's no need to be working on ramification necessarily at that time. If, for example, you have a Japanese maple that's a little bit weak from the previous growing season, perhaps you don't do that pinching in the spring either. Just allow it to grow so you get that hormonal exchange happening within the plant, and then you get a better growing plant for the growing season. Once you start moving a little bit further into later development and into refinement, this is when you're gonna switch over your technique with your Japanese maple and actually pinch out that center shoot as it starts to emerge in early spring. Now, if you're doing this year after year after year, the tree might weaken a little bit over time. So there may be a year, say three years down the line, where you allow it to grow again in the spring. And then you start repeating that pinching process the next year. So it's all dictated by the health of the tree and the stage of development of the plant as well. So definitely keep that in mind. But again, as a general rule of thumb, in the early spring, just let all of your trees grow unimpeded, don't cut them back, let that hormone exchange happen, and you're gonna have healthier, more vigorous plants for the rest of the growing season. All right, next up here, let's talk about fertilization in the spring. So both the type of fertilizer that I use and the timing for the application of the fertilizer is going to be dictated by the stage of development of the tree. So we've got trees that are early in development, trees that are kind of mid-range development, and then trees that are moving into refinement. So let's start out with trees that are in early stages of development, like this Japanese maple right here. So first thing in early spring, I'm going to be applying a synthetic high nitrogen fertilizer to plants like this. The reason being is that I wanna put on a lot of top growth on the tree in a very short amount of time for one specific reason, and that is really to thicken up the trunk. So in the spring, I'm gonna be allowing a terminal shoot at the top here to elongate over the course of the entire growing season and potentially up to two or three growing seasons depending on how thick I want the trunk to be. So to get that really early, fast, rapid development on these trees, I'll apply something like an Osmoco Plus, which has a 15 value for the nitrogen. So again, that nitrogen is gonna put on elongating internodes and larger leaves on the tree, but a lot of fast, rapid top growth on the plant, which is exactly what I want. Now, in terms of the application rate for something like this, I recommend that you follow whatever the recommended application rate is on the pack packaging based on the volume of soil in your pot. One thing about using a high nitrogen fertilizer is that that nitrogen can burn off or damage those fine new roots that are emerging in spring. So if you overdo it, you can really weaken and damage your plant. So make sure to follow directions. So for example, a tree like this guy right here, I would be putting on about one teaspoon, not tablespoon, but teaspoon of Osmocote Plus in the early spring. And then over the course of the growing season, I would be adding more Osmocote Plus every say three to four months, depending on how the tree is responding. So what about trees that are a little bit further along in their development? So for example, let's take a look at the two trees that are beside me here. These are Stewartia monodelpha that have been in training for about six to seven years. They were started out as cuttings and then several trunks were actually fused together at the base. And over the last six to seven years, we've developed them to the state that you see them in here. So again, at the very beginning and early development, we were throwing on that Osmocote Plus, letting the terminal shoots elongate on these guys, essentially doing very little work to them other than basic pruning as we got further along into the summer. Now, about two years ago, when they were about five years into development, I started to switch up the fertilizer regimen, both the type of fertilizer I was using and the timing for the application of that fertilizer. So the reason that I started to do that is because I wanted to start working on the ramification development on the tree. And as you guys know, when we're trying to develop ramification on the tree, we want small internodes and relatively small leaves on the plant. So in order to produce that, what I do is I actually completely hold off on fertilization in the early spring once they get to this stage of development. So that's going to give you tighter internodes on the plant, again, smaller leaves on the tree, 
We're allowing everything to elongate. Even the terminal shoots, I'm still letting those elongate. I'm allowing all the lower growth to elongate as well. But once we move a little bit further into late spring going into early summer, once that new growth starts hardening off, at that stage, we can start applying a fertilizer. You're not gonna run into elongated internodes or large leaves at that point. So of course, this is going to allow us to produce those fine branches down at the bottom that we can then start to develop into nice tight ramification as the tree progresses into the future. Now, the type of fertilizer that I'm going to be applying as we get into late spring and into early summer is going to shift as well. So we're gonna shift away from that Osmocote Plus over to something like a Grow Power, which is what I use here at ASAN. Now, Grow Power is a 1288, so it's a little bit lower on the nitrogen value. It's also an organic fertilizer as well, and it does have a lot of micronutrients in it too, like molybdenum, zinc, copper, iron, and actually humic acid as well. So you're gonna get a lot of knock-on effects, again, for these plants as you move into the growing season switching over to that slightly lower nitrogen fertilizer with all of those micronutrients in it. So as we get into summer, I'll explain the fertilizer regimen a little bit more, but I wanted to give you guys an understanding in early spring with our trees that are early in development and mid-development here. Okay, so quick side note here, I've jumped forward a few months and we're in early winter right now, but I wanted to show you the effects of the fertilizer regimen in late spring going into early summer and how it actually affects the growth on the tree. So of course I mentioned that we're trying to keep the inner nodes small at the base of the tree, so that initial flush of growth, I don't wanna apply any fertilizer to so that we can create that really tight compact growth here at the base. Now, once I actually start applying the fertilizer after that first flush is hardened off, I'm pruning this section back, possibly defoliating this section, but I'm allowing the upper portion of the tree to elongate to thicken the trunks. So you can see here, once I start applying the fertilizer in late spring, early summer, after that initial flush of growth is hardened off, the inner nodes at the top here are noticeably larger and longer than the inner nodes down here at the base. So you can really see the effects of holding off on the fertilizer for that initial flush of growth and then applying the fertilizer to that second flush of growth as you get into early summer going through the summer growing season. So let's move on to trees that are further along into refinement. So I'm gonna treat those trees basically exactly the same way as the trees that are in this stage. So again, no fertilizer in the early spring. We're working on that ramification development or we're essentially just maintaining the ramification that's there. So again, we don't want elongated internodes. We don't want large leaves. No fertilizer in the spring. Once that growth again hardens off late spring, early summer, I'll start applying a fertilizer at that point. With those trees though, I'm not going to use such a high nitrogen fertilizer like the Grow Power. I'm gonna switch it down to something with a very low nitrogen like a Tamahi or a Biogold. So these fertilizers are gonna have end values anywhere from six to eight, but as long as it's below about a 10, you should be absolutely a-okay. That's not gonna produce overly thick branches and it's going to allow you to maintain the health of the tree throughout the growing season. Okay, so the last thing I wanna cover here for our spring segment is the application of fungicides and pesticides. So as a general rule of thumb, I don't typically use topical sprays in the early spring as the new fleshy growth is starting to emerge. I think you know quite often you can run into problems if you over apply it, for example, or if you mix the wrong ratio of whatever you happen to be using. So what I tend to like to do is actually apply systemic granular, both fungicide and pesticide to the soil. So in early spring, just as all that new water is being absorbed up into the plant to produce that first flush of growth, applying something like Infuse, which is a systemic fungicide, that's going to be rapidly absorbed up into the plant right at that time of year and help inoculate the plant against diseases going into later spring. Now, at that same time, I will be applying something like imidacloprid, which is a systemic pesticide. That's also gonna be rapidly absorbed into the tree and take care of things like boars, mites, and all sorts of other pests in early spring too. So the application rate for each of those is going to be dependent on the size of the pot that you're working with. If you've ever looked at the big bags of those granular pesticides and fungicides, you'll notice that they're designed to be spread on like football fields or at golf courses, for example. So you have to make sure that you're applying it at the right rate and it's pretty much impossible to calculate exactly what you need. So just to give you kind of a general guideline here, what I'll do is for shoheen sized trees, I'll take a teaspoon and I'll apply essentially a quarter to a half of a teaspoon per pot of our shoheen trees. As we get up to medium sized trees, I'll apply essentially a full teaspoon of each of those to the soil. And for our larger trees, we'll apply up to a full tablespoon if it's a massive tree. So anywhere in that mid range from a full teaspoon to a full tablespoon for your larger trees should absolutely be totally fine. 
So just don't overdo it. You know, you could potentially run into issues with killing off beneficial bacteria and fungi in the soil if you overdo it. So just keep that in mind. But in any case, I just want you guys to sort of understand the spring maintenance section here. Hope that makes a lot of sense to you guys. And we're going to move on to our summer section coming up here next. Okay. All right. I didn't realize that I talked that fast when I recorded the video. <laughs> so uh, there's a lot of information in there, but uh, what kind of questions do you guys have for me regarding the, the spring maintenance for your broadleaf evergreen and deciduous trees? Bjorn, uh, you were working mostly with those uh, deciduous trees. Do the same ratios for fertilizer and fungicide, pesticide, that is also uh, applicable to the uh, evergreens, the, the conifers? It is, yeah. There's a lot of overlap between uh, the two. Uh, you know, the, the variation in technique comes more with wiring and, and pruning uh, differences. So yeah, the application rate for the fertilizer and for the fungicides and pesticides in the spring and really through the growing season as well is going to be basically the same. Okay, thanks. All right, looks like there, there might be some uh, questions in the... Uh, chat here as well. I'll just go ahead and read these off if that's all right with you guys and then answer them. Um, so let's see, this one's from Matt. He says, uh, it's a bit off topic of the video, but if you have time to answer in the chat, that'd be awesome. Uh, I watched your Kabadachi video on YouTube last spring and made one with five large seedlings. They grew well last year and I'm wondering if I should be doing any work on it this spring, like spreading the roots or removing the band around the trunks uh, or give it another year to grow. Uh, okay, so this is in reference to a video that I did on YouTube, uh, styling a Japanese maple or taking Japanese maple seedlings rather, and fusing the bases of those together to create a kabodachi style or clump style tree. Um, so, you know, we did that last March, it's a pretty typical time to, you know, band those trunks together at the base, either using a wire or a zip tie, for example, uh, or even a rubber band, uh, you could use that as well. Uh, what I would recommend is it depends on your goal with the tree as to whether or not you remove that band this year or you leave it alone. So in other words, if you're going to leave the band on the tree and you have that band actually covered up by the soil, it's likely to ground layer above that band uh, and produce a decent nabari. Now with larches, I don't know how they're going to respond to that. I don't work with larches. It's way too uh, hot here in Tennessee. Uh, but with your Japanese maples, trident maples, most of your deciduous trees, if you leave the band, it will produce a new nabari over the top of that, and then you can remove the original root system. So I would leave the band on for at least one more year, if not two years. If you're wanting the band to just hold and fuse the trunks, but you want to keep the root system below the band, I would go ahead and remove the band this spring, take a look at it. If it has fused together, I'd leave the band off. If it looks like it's still a little bit loose, I'd reapply the band, but not make it as tight excuse me, as tight as you did uh, last year. So hopefully that uh, answers your question. Yeah, thanks so much. All right, cool. Uh, let's see here. Uh, another one in the chat, is there a cost to visit your garden? Uh, I know your website says appointment only. Yeah, so we, we do just a small cost um, to visit the garden. I think it's like uh, 10 or 15 bucks to visit per car, uh, you know, per group. Um, but if you end up getting something at the nursery, we, we give you that money back. The only reason that we do that is because I, I had so many people book a tour of the nursery and then never show up. And we have so many things that we have to do. And I had to kind of build my schedule around people coming to visit the nursery. And I'd say probably 50% of the people never showed up to the appointment that they made. Um, so we started doing a small cost uh, with that. But uh, like I said, if you do come uh, and you purchase something at the nursery, you, you obviously get that back. So uh, let's see, this one's from Rennie. Uh, Rennie says, for Japanese maples in refinement, are you not worried about bleeding when pinching in early spring? Not at all. Um, you know, the new fleshy shoots that are emerging, you know, obviously you've got the uh, opposite leaf pattern, you've got the shoot running through the center. The, the goal with your older Japanese maples or when you're trying to develop ramification is to pinch out that center shoot as soon as it starts to appear. You can do it with tweezers, scissors, or uh, by hand with your fingers. Um, the shoot itself is so small that when you pinch it, it's not going to bleed. And if it does bleed, it's not going to be anything significant. Uh, another thing to keep in mind too is in the spring with your Japanese maples, it's very common for certain sections of the tree to start opening buds earlier than other sections. So as the tree is starting to put out that new growth in the spring, say for example, it's just the lowest branch that has the first buds that are emerging. Go ahead and pinch that area as they emerge. Wait for the apex to pop out maybe a week later and then pinch that area. 
Uh, it just makes it a lot easier to kind of cycle through your trees and keep everything on track if you do it that way. Uh, but in any case, I wouldn't worry about uh, bleeding on your Japanese maples just by pinching in the spring. Um, let's see, do you apply fungicide and pesticide in the spring for all trees or only those that have issues? Um, so we have so many trees at the nursery here uh, and a lot of very expensive material as well um, and a lot of money invested in that material that I want to treat things preventively rather than in reaction uh, to pests and diseases emerging. So we cover, we cover essentially every tree in the spring this fungicide and pesticide. So those midocloprid and infused, everything will get treated with that in the spring. And then as we get into the growing season, we shift over to more topical sprays. Um, and actually in the next section of the video here, I'll explain uh, exactly what we use here and what schedule uh, we apply that stuff to our trees. Uh, let's see, next question here is, uh, do you have any experience uh, with California live oaks? Hey, I do Bjorn, uh, uh, yeah. Bert, this, is, uh, this is me, Gordon. Uh, yeah. I asked that, and the, the, I love California live oaks, and I just, uh, they're really sensitive to the soil mix and being repotted is what I've discovered. So I actually find the best thing that they grow in is actually regular potting soil because they seem to be so sensitive. And so when I saw the title of this presentation of broadleaf evergreens, I was just sort of curious, <laughs> Did you have you worked with live oaks or maybe other people in the society have worked with live oaks and have some ideas? Uh, I personally have never worked with them before, so I don't want to give you bad advice or put you down the wrong path. Um, so, you know, it's definitely worth experimenting with. And if you've had, you know, better success putting them in, in <clears throat> potting soil, I would stick with that. Although, uh, I don't know if you've tried putting them in like 100% Akadama, for example. Um, that might be something worth experimenting with. You might get a little bit faster drainage and maybe faster development on those trees, but I don't know, you know what their pH needs are um, and how that might affect the growth on the tree. So I don't want to give you bad advice about that. No, but that was, that was actually one of the ideas. Should you try 100% Akadama? But they're like so sensitive to being repotted or just being put into anything. Um, and uh, anyways, but yeah, 100% Akadama is something I've been sort of curious about. If anybody in the society has any ideas, I'd love to hear your thoughts too on this. Thanks. Cool. Uh, yeah. I I mean, some, oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. I have some scrub oak uh, that just popped up because a bunch of squirrels just were squirreling away acorns like crazy. So I had a whole ton of seedlings. I put some in bonsai soil and half in regular soil. All the ones in the bonsai soil are dead. Hmm. That's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good to Hi, know. Bjorn. Hey, Larry, how you doing? I'm doing well. In the collection of DBG, we have a California live oak. Mm -hmm. Came from California through Massachusetts. Okay. And uh, I talked with Ted Matson about it several times, and he said they seem to flourish best with some decomposed granite in the mix. Hmm. A very good draining mix. So. I've used that mix and the plant is just, it's growing great. As a matter of fact, right now it's in a cold greenhouse, lowest temperature be about 40 degrees and it's already pushing buds everywhere. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. What, what, what else do you have in the mix besides the, the granite? I have some uh, lava rock and just a little bit of the organic stuff that we use in our greenhouse, not very much. So the drainage is really great. In the summertime, it sits in full sun on a south-facing bench in our garden outside. Okay. Well, Gordon, hopefully that uh, will set you on the right path that you can try yeah. that. Gordon, you know, we, I, can, I, we can I, I take wanna, a look at that. Yeah, I, I would. I, I don't want to hug the conversation from everybody. But, you know, when I Googled this, you know, the only thing that came up was like on Mirai. And they said somebody on the chat or the – blog there said, you know, even 80% uh, uh, pumice was actually, and I didn't, I was ask, ask you, Larry, is that, is 80% pumice sort of equivalent to your decomposed granite? Or maybe we could just exchange emails about this or so. Sure. What's, what's happening with both of these is you've got great drainage and great aeration because of the nature of the material. Yeah. That the yeah. trait is probably more important than the actual substance that we're using. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for your uh, you for your advice yeah. and comments. Cool. All right.
Um, okay, uh, we'll look at the chat here again. There's another question from uh, Coop. It says, I have a 10-year-old lion's head maple. It's a shishigashira, uh, and I've developed a four to five inch trunk diameter on it. I plan to chop it down from its five foot height to develop it into a shorter tree, basically a trunk chop. Uh, what's a good time of year to do this? Um, okay, so a couple things here. Uh, when you're dealing with a, a maple or any deciduous tree uh, that has a trunk that's already that large on it, I would be very, very careful how quickly you cut it down very short. Um, so, you know, for example, if your intended eventual height on the tree is, I don't know, let's just say like two, two feet or two and a half feet, I would not cut it down to that height right now. I would slowly work it down over the course of a couple of years, maybe even take air layers of the upper portion of the trunk. So you're propagating it in the process. Um, and the reason I say that is because if you do a massive trunk chop that quick down low on the tree, uh, particularly with a Japanese maple like that, you're likely to cause dieback further down the trunk. You know, so if you're cutting something four to five inches in diameter, it's very likely to die further back down the trunk. And then you end up with a much larger wound that's almost impossible to heal over. Um, so I would do it, you know, slowly in stages. Uh, but to answer your question directly here, what time of year is a good time to do this? I would recommend doing any major uh, you know, cuts on your deciduous trees after the first flush of growth has come out and completely hardened off. Uh, so for us here in Tennessee, that would be usually mid to late May would be the perfect time to do those cuts. Uh, where you guys are, it might be a little bit later, you know, late May, maybe even into early June possibly. Um, and the reason I say that is because if you do the big cuts in early spring, when the new growth is starting to emerge on the tree, a lot of water is being sucked up through the plant and you're likely to cause a lot of bleeding on the tree in you know, February, March, April. If you do major cuts in the winter, uh, the problem doing them in the winter is that there's no callus formation right after you do the big cut. So it's likely to dry out around the edges of the wound and potentially get larger over the remainder of the winter. Uh, so, you know, to answer your question, as soon as the leaves harden off, that would be the best time uh, to do a major cut. And actually later in this video, I show you exactly how to do that uh, and how to start healing over those big wounds as well. Uh, let's see here. One from Will Kearns says for deciduous trees in spring, how long are you leaving Osmocote on? Uh, and then do you move to Biogold? So it may not have been, uh, I should have been a little more clear in the video. Basically, if I'm going to be using Osmocote for a tree, uh, it's going to be for a tree that's in early stages of development. And I'm going to use that all through the entire growing season on that tree. I'm not going to switch from Osmocote and then to, uh, you know, grow power and then to uh, like Biogold, for example, in one growing season. I'm going to stick with Osmocote throughout the entire growing season. So like I said in the video, I would switch out or add more Osmocote, usually every three months, maybe every four months or so, depending on how quickly the tree's growing. Um, and then, you know, as the trees move into that mid stage of development, that next growing season, I will then start applying grow power to those trees. And I do that for the entire growing season. And then once the trees get further along into refinement for the entire growing season, I'll then switch over to like a bio gold, for example. And that all has to do with the nitrogen value, uh, within each of those fertilizers and the uh, sort of intended goal at that particular stage with the tree. Um, can, can, yes. Sorry, go ahead. Can, I, can I go back quickly to your last uh, answer about trunk chops? Sure. I had a um, Sangokaku maple nursery stock that I repotted into a bonsai pot last spring it was doing great. I thought I would do a trunk chop when the leaves hardened off. And I thought, oh, why not air layer the top? Mm -hmm. So I did that. Uh, never grew roots. And after a few weeks, the base started turning purplish black and it just died from the base up. Is, is that, does that relate to what you were saying about chopping too low too early? Uh, possibly, yeah. How, I have to see the tree and then see all the variables that went into it. If it's rotting from the base of the tree up. Are you talking from the actual root system of the tree up the trunk or from the air layer up? No, from the, the trunk below the air layer. The trunk below the air layer? The uh, air layers from the air layer up survived longer than the lower trunk did. Gotcha, okay. Um, yeah, it's hard to say uh, what caused that. It could have been any number of issues. It could have been a fungal issue that was already contained systemically within the tree and then it just putzed out over the rest of the growing season. Uh, could have been overwatering, for example. Uh, were there any branches below the air layer when you were taking the air layer? 
A couple, yeah. A couple, yeah. So the, the, that shouldn't have been a problem. I mean, when you're doing an air layer on a deciduous tree, you don't have to have branches below the air layer, although it's a good idea if there's at least some branching there. Um, you know, if you're dealing with like a juniper, for example, you've got to have foliage both above and below the air layer. Otherwise, it's likely not to take. Um, so I, it's kind of hard to answer that question uh, without knowing all the, the variables. So sorry about okay, that. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see here. Um, oh. Real quick, Mjorn, um, before you move on to the next question, um, you were saying that you use the Osmocote for that growing season. Um, being that it's so high in nitrogen, what point in time do you, I guess, stop using the fertilizer to avoid any growth in the like fall that wouldn't harden off in time for the winter? Okay, that's a really, really good question. Uh, I'll actually address that in the video uh, in the fall section. So if you're cool, we'll hold off on that one and you'll answer the, uh, I think a full answer. Okay. If, if it's still not clear uh, by the end, just let me know and I'll clarify a few things for you. Cool, That's, thanks. Yeah, totally legitimate question. All right, um, let's see. Here we go. Uh, one from Tony says, I noticed several net pots in the video. Um, do you use them for younger trees or what makes you select a net pot for a given tree? Yeah, so I use the net pots or the colanders or the pond baskets for trees that are very early in development that we're trying to really thicken the trunks on. Um, and trees that are kind of moving into early uh, stages of not refinement, but kind of, or maybe mid development we would be better to say. Um, you get a lot of aeration to the root system. They grow very, very quickly uh, as long as you can water them frequently because they will dry out. Uh, so you definitely have to keep on top of that. We water our deciduous stuff here in the spring, I guess probably three times a day uh, because they're sucking up so much moisture from the water, to, uh, from the soil rather, to produce uh, the new set of leaves. Uh, we water them constantly. And then as we get into the growing season, you know, once to twice a day. Um, and then by the time we get into fall, it's, it's obviously less than that, maybe once every other day or so. Uh, so as long as you can keep on top of the water, a net pot will be great. Uh, the second best thing, you know, depending on what you're trying to do with your trees in terms of pot selection would be a wooden box. Um, so if you're developing nabari on a Japanese maple, for example, a very shallow wooden box is also going to provide a lot of aeration to the roots. We give you that outward growth rather than the downward growth of the root system that you would get in a net pot. Uh, let's see from Dan. He says, I have a Sagan Japanese maple that I'm hoping to air layer branches from after the leaves harden off. Uh, any special tricks? I've heard Sagan can be difficult. Uh, they can be relatively difficult. I actually have uh, a large Sagan here that I bought uh, from a grower up in uh, Long Island. It's a, a full size tree. It's like, I don't know, 12 feet tall or so. Uh, but I bought it specifically to take air layers off of. And uh, I had my apprentice do them in May this last year. And I think 85% of them took, 90% of them took. Uh, so what we typically do is, you know, just a standard kind of peeling the bark off um, down to the xylem, which is the hardwood. Uh, so you got to get the, uh, you know, obviously the bark, the phloem, the cambium, and then you get down to the xylem. Uh, we use something called Clonex, uh, which is a, a gel uh, rooting hormone. Uh, we'll put it around the upper ring on each of those branches. And then we use just pure sphagnum. And I, I actually use the net pots this year with the sphagnum in them as the containers for the air layers. And we had really good success with that. So, um, you know, as soon as it leaves hard enough, that's a perfect time to do it. Um, so, you know, where you are uh, up in Wyoming, that could be, I would imagine probably like late May, early June, possibly. We do most of ours uh, first two weeks of May here. Um, okay, next one is from uh, Joshua. He says, for Japanese maples here in Colorado, uh, where things can really dry out, any suggestions for soil mix? I've been adding sphagnum moss to the top layer of the soil uh, using Boone mix, but wondering if there's a better approach, maybe all Akadama. I actually think where you guys are, because it's so dry and there's no humidity there, I think 100% Akadama is probably your best option. Um, and then putting a layer of sphagnum moss on the soil surface is also great. But what I recommend you do is, you know, when you buy the long fibered sphagnum moss, you don't just want to make it wet and just slap it on top. What you want to do is take a chunk of it and then kind of find a way that you can cheese grate the, the, the uh, uh, sphagnum into a bucket of water to make it very, very fine. Um, so what I typically do, I don't know if you guys are familiar with like the, the painters, um, I don't know what you'd call it. Uh, it's like a grate essentially that you set on top of the bucket of paint to put your paintbrush on and let it drain through. You can pick them up at Walmart for like $2. I recommend you go buy one of those. You can set it on top of your bucket and take a chunk of sphagnum and run it back and forth over that. 
the sphagnum will then uh, you know, become very fine, drop into the bucket, and then you can fill that with water. And then the layer that you wanna put on the soil surface, I would not make it any thicker than about an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch, somewhere in that range. If you make it too thick, it's gonna be hard to tell if the soil is drying out underneath, um, and you may end up keeping it too wet and causing root rot on your tree. So, uh, but I, I recommend a combination of those things, 100% Akadama, and then the sphagnum on the soil surface. Uh, let's see. Okay, that was the last one in the chat. Um, does anybody have any other questions before we jump back to the video? Okay, so in this segment, I wanna talk about the pruning techniques for your broadleaf evergreen and deciduous trees as we move into summer. Now, the best thing here is to divide all of the species that we're working with into those two big broad phyllotaxy categories or leaf pattern categories that I mentioned earlier in this tutorial. So on one side of the spectrum, we have our alternating leaf pattern trees. These are gonna be trees like flowering apricot, stewardia, beech, hornbeam, and a whole plethora of other species. And then on the other side of the spectrum, we've got our opposite leaf pattern trees, which will be things like maples. So what I wanna do here is start out with the alternating leaf pattern trees. So first and foremost here, let's address the growth that we allowed to elongate in the spring season. As we get into the first part of summer, which here is gonna be essentially early to mid-May, at that stage, that growth that we've allowed to elongate in the spring will have hardened off by that point. So what does this mean? This means that that new fleshy growth that came out in spring that was kind of a fluorescent green color will have turned to a dark hunter green, for example, with most species, and the fleshy texture will have turned more to a hard kind of waxy texture. At this stage, we can say that the tree has hardened off. So in your environment, that could be a little bit earlier or it could be a little bit later, but as a general rule of thumb, we're looking at sometime in the month of May for this to be the case. Now at that stage, if your trees are nice and healthy, if they've elongated, if they're looking good, you should have anywhere from six to eight leaves on each of those shoots that has elongated. What we're gonna do with each of those shoots is somewhat dependent on the long-term goal with that particular branch. So for example, if you're working with a branch that you're trying to elongate and thicken, you're going to allow the terminal shoot to elongate unimpeded. We're not gonna do anything to those shoots. If on the other hand, we wanna start working on pushing the growth back, starting to develop ramification, starting to develop movement within the branches, we need to actually prune at this time of year. Now with those shoots that have elongated to six to eight leaves, what we're gonna be doing at this stage is actually cutting back on average to two leaves with a dormant bud at the base. So to make this process easier, we're gonna go into the workshop and take a look at a Chinese quince, which is an alternating leaf pattern tree. I'm gonna show you exactly what this process looks like. Okay, so the first technique we're gonna be applying to this tree is just a simple cutback of all the elongated shoots. I'm gonna bring the camera in a little bit closer here and we're gonna talk about the nuances and details of how we decide where and how far to cut back. All right, let's take a look at this shoot right here. You'll notice that we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven leaves on this particular shoot. So this is perfect timing to do a simple cutback across the entire tree. Now, you've probably read in various locations on the internet or in different books about cutting back on average to two leaves across the entire tree. Well, technically this is true, but what we wanna do is be a little bit more careful than just willy-nilly cutting back to two leaves on each shoot. There are a couple things we need to keep in mind. So number one is going to be that the first leaf back here on the interior it's almost always a misshapen leaf, a little bit smaller than the leaves further out on the shoot, and it doesn't have a bud at the very base down here. This is what's called a susoba in Japanese, which basically translates to a budless leaf. So what that means is at the very base of this leaf, right where it attaches to the shoot, there is no latent bud here. So just as an example, if we were to cut all the way back to that first leaf, because there's no latent bud there, it's likely not to form a new shoot here, and we may actually end up killing off this branch. So what we wanna do is ignore that first leaf and start our leaf count from the second leaf out. So this is going to be leaf number one, then leaf number two, and we would cut back to here, like so. Again, you wanna ignore that first leaf right there. Now, one thing you can also do is if the canopy is very, very full on the tree and a lot of light is not really penetrating to the interior, you can actually go ahead and remove that susoba. It's not really serving any purpose. It's not going to be detrimental to that particular branch on the tree. And again, it allows a little bit more light to penetrate to the interior. Another thing you should be considering is the directionality of the secondary shoot. So in other words, what that means is whatever leaf that we're cutting back to, 
whatever direction that leaf is pointing, when we cut back, you're going to activate the bud at the base of that leaf to elongate and grow, and it's gonna grow in the same direction that that leaf is pointing. So on this particular branch right here, you'll notice that this is our susoba back here. This would be our second leaf, or really our first leaf in the count, and then the second leaf in the count a little bit further out. Well, the problem is if we were to cut this back to here, that next shoot is then going to emerge from the top and shoot straight up, which is not ideal. We're trying to create a downward sort of lateral undulating branch pattern on the tree, and this would destroy that. So in the case of this branch, we are actually going to cut back to just one leaf here, again, ignoring the susoba, because this leaf is in the right direction and that secondary shoot that will start emerging over the next few weeks will emerge in the proper direction. This is essentially clip and grow or directional pruning on alternating leaf pattern, deciduous and broadleaf species. Here is another example where directional pruning is very important. So for example, you see the shoot coming out here. We've got this leaf sort of protruding back towards the interior, this leaf here coming out towards the exterior. You never wanna cut back to a leaf that's going to then produce a shoot that goes back in towards the interior of the plant. We always wanna to cut to a shoot that's going to protrude towards the exterior of the plant. It always looks messy and jumbled to have a lot of branches going back towards the interior. So again, always look for cutting back to leaves like this that are sticking out towards the exterior so that that next shoot that starts emerging here also emerges towards the exterior of the plant. All right, now that we have a grasp of how to prune our alternating leaf pattern trees in the early part of summer, let's talk about a secondary technique that we can apply at that same time of year. And this would be defoliation, and more specifically what I call partial outer canopy defoliation. So before we get started here, what I wanna do is divide our alternating leaf pattern trees up into two separate categories. So we have trees that can be partially defoliated and trees that I recommend you not partially defoliate. So trees in the latter category that I don't think you should defoliate would be plants like hornbeam and beech. If you were to defoliate those trees, you're likely to produce an imbalance of energy across the plant. So for example, if you do defoliate them, you may get a second flush of growth that has large leaves on certain branches, small leaves on other branches, and no leaves on other branches, and those branches would likely die off. So you, know, you might try it on younger trees, for example, but I don't recommend that you do it year after year after year on those species. On the flip side though, we have our alternating leaf pattern trees that can be defoliated. These would be plants like flowering apricot, stewardia, eleagnus, and a plethora of other trees. So the benefit, of course, of being able to partially defoliate those trees is that you're gonna produce a smaller second flush of growth. You're also going to produce more growth on the plant, so more ramification and finer branching as well. So this is when we start moving into the later stages of development into refinement, when we're gonna be doing this partial outer canopy defoliation on these species. So the time for doing this defoliation technique is gonna be essentially right after you do the first cutback of those elongating shoots in early summer. So we'll cut those shoots back, we'll then defoliate essentially 80 to 90% of the outer canopy of the entire tree. That's going to allow light to penetrate to the interior of the plant and strengthen those interior buds. Again, you're gonna get a second flush of growth on the externality of the plant, which is gonna be smaller growth, more growth, and finer growth, which is what we want. Because again, with our deciduous trees, for the most part, we're gonna be showing them, or ideally showing them, in the winter in their silhouette form. So this is what's gonna produce that really fine, beautiful ramification on the plant. Now, once you've defoliated those trees, I recommend that you do not then apply fertilizer at that stage, because essentially, you're knocking the trees back to an early spring setting, which means that next flush of growth that's going to come out is going to elongate just like the first flush of growth. So at that stage, if you start throwing on a bunch of high nitrogen fertilizer, you're going to produce elongated internodes and very large leaves on that second flush of growth. So you're gonna to wanna to hold off on fertilization on those plants at that stage. You're gonna to wanna to wait until that second flush of growth has completely come out and hardened off, and then you're gonna start the fertilizer application, just like we talked about earlier in the spring. Now on the flip side of that, those species that I recommend that you do not defoliate, you can actually start applying fertilizer to those after the first cutback. That's not a problem at all. And again, depending on where the tree is in development, I would use one of those three types of fertilizers that we talked about earlier. All right, so what about our opposite leaf pattern trees, like our maples, for example? So again, I wanna divide these guys up into the same two categories. We've got the trees that can be partially defoliated and those that should not be partially defoliated. So the trees that can be defoliated would be like your trident maples, for example. These guys are very vigorous growing plants and you can actually do multiple defoliations over the course of a growing season, depending on where you live and depending on the vigor of that specific tree. 
Now on the other end of the spectrum, those trees that I recommend you don't partially defoliate would be like Japanese maples, for example. Now, if you're dealing with a very young tree that's very vigorously growing, or even an older tree that has really elongated inner nodes, maybe you do partial outer canopy defoliation, but not on a yearly basis. Say you do it this year, maybe skip one or two years and then do it again. Whereas with the trident maples, you can reliably do it year after year after year, no problem at all. So the timing for doing this technique is gonna be exactly the same as the timing for our alternating leaf pattern species. So just after the first flush of growth has completely hardened off and the elongating growth has really come out on the plants. Now, you know, I talked earlier about your Japanese maples pinching the center shoot out in early spring. That's really with trees that are further along in refinement. So with those plants, you're really not going to be defoliating those anyway, so you don't have to worry about that. With the trident maples though, I would treat them like your alternating leaf pattern trees, let them flush out, elongate, grow, unimpeded in the spring, and then you can do that first cut, cutting back to the first pair of leaves and defoliating the externality of the plant all at the same time in May. You basically kill two birds with one stone. That way you're not wasting time pinching out the center shoot on your trident and then defoliating it later. You can do it all in May at the same time. Now with fertilization, of course, we're gonna hold off on applying fertilizer to the trees that we've defoliated until that second flush of growth has hardened off. If you're working with a trident maple though that can be defoliated two, three, four times over the course of a growing season, I would not fertilize until the final flush of growth after the final defoliation has come out and hardened off. So for example, a tree like this will do the first defoliation in May, second defoliation possibly in late June, early July, and maybe a third defoliation in late July, early August. So we may not be fertilizing these guys until the end of August or early September. Now that's a bit extreme. I don't typically defoliate that many times in a growing season, but it is possible. And I just want you guys to know how and when to fertilize these guys following defoliation. All right, in this section of the tutorial, I wanna talk about heavy pruning and major cutbacks on your broadleaf evergreen and deciduous trees. So coming into early summer, just after the leaves have hardened off, is the perfect time to do major cutbacks on a vast majority of your broadleaf evergreen and deciduous trees. The reason being is that in the spring, as water is being sucked up from the roots into the tree to produce that first flush of growth, you have a lot of moisture within the tissue of the tree. So if you were to do a major cutback in the spring season as the new flush of growth is coming out, you could potentially cause a lot of bleeding and maybe even dieback of certain portions of the tree. Or at the very least, you could weaken the plant. So once we get to the point where that first flush of growth has completely hardened off, which here in Nashville is the first or second week of May, a vast majority of that water has already been brought up, produced the leaves, and then you're getting a transfer of hormones back down to the base of the plant at that point. So at that time of year, right after the leaves have hardened off, it's a great time to do major cutbacks on most of your broadleaf evergreen and deciduous trees. Now, as a general rule of thumb, I recommend that you try to avoid making wounds that are bigger than about two to two and a half inches in diameter on any given tree. Anything larger than that is going to be very difficult to heal, or if it does heal, it's going to be very obvious. So try to be strategic about how thick you want branches to be before you cut them off. If you're gonna be doing a trunk chop, for example, on a tree, make sure you're doing it strategically so that trunk isn't already four inches in diameter because you're probably gonna run into major developmental problems or little healing or potentially even major scarring on those trunks if the wounds are too large. So definitely keep that in mind. But moral of the story here, the best time of year to do those major cutbacks is going to be in May to early June. So, you know, the early part of summer, basically. One of the other worst times of year that you can do major cutbacks is going to be in the winter season. So if the tree is completely dormant at that point, which it should be if you're living in a temperate climate, you do a major cutback, you make a wound that's you know an inch or two or even three inches in diameter, that is not going to heal. There's gonna be no callus formation at all over the remainder of the winter. So what's gonna happen is that wound is going to dry out around the edges and potentially become bigger than it was when you initially created it. So you wanna avoid doing major cutbacks in the winter, wait until everything Thing hardens off in May to early June, do your major cutbacks at that point, and then you'll get a second flush of growth. So this tree right next to me here is a good example of what I'm talking about here. This is an Eliagnus or a silverberry. This is a type of tree that you can actually pick up at a lot of Home Depots and Lowe's around town, but they make excellent bonsai. This tree right here originally when it was purchased looked like this. So it was a giant bush. As a matter of fact, this came from the same stock that this guy is from here. So it was a giant bush that looked like this. We hacked this tree way back, removed all of the foliage on the plant. We hacked it back to essentially nothing, just a basic simple structure on the tree looking for good primary lines. Did a little bit of wiring on the plant. 
We did that again in late May here, so uh, perfect timing. And then right now we're in mid-July. So you can see it's just a little over a month later. It's really starting to fill back in and look really nice. So a vast majority of younger trees that you're working with, broadleaf evergreen and deciduous trees, you can do this type of major cutback too. As a tree gets much older in its development, if it needs a major cutback, you're gonna to have to be a little bit more strategic and careful about how aggressively you cut those trees back. So for example, a Japanese maple, if you were to do a major cutback on a very old tree, cutting things back to nubs, for example, they may not flush out with a second flush of growth and you might end up losing major branches on the tree or even whole portions of the trunk. So you have to be somewhat careful, but I would assume that a majority of you guys out there are working with younger material like this right here. The vast majority of this material, you can do major cutbacks in May, early June, no problem at all. Now you'll notice on here too, we did a little bit of cut paste application as well. That's to heal those wounds over, to seal them up so we don't get any fungal diseases entering through those wounds that potentially causing further dieback on the trees. So this tree, once it was all styled up, we put it outside in partial shade under the 30% shade cloth, allowed everything to flush back out. And then later this season, once we get some better extension growth on the tree, we'll do another cutback on this plant at that point. But keep in mind, you know, this is very early on in the development of this tree. So it still looks like, you know, a, a skin chicken basically at this point, but getting things cut back to a basic primary structure with good primary lines is absolutely necessary early on in the development of your broadleaf evergreen and deciduous trees. All right, so this brings us to the section of the tutorial about how to close large wounds once you've created them on the tree. Now, right here, we've got a Japanese maple, just a standard Acer palmatum. This tree was field grown for a number of years and then trunk chopped and some of the larger lower branches were also hacked off of the tree. So this has left the tree with a few relatively large wounds, the largest of which is about two inches in diameter. So there are a couple of things that we need to do with a tree like this to help heal those wounds. First things first is to get it into a very free draining, very porous mix. So that Aoki blend that I mentioned earlier, 50% uh, Akadama, 25% Kidu, and 25% Lava is actually perfect for healing large wounds on a tree like this. If you have your tree in a very heavy organic soil, you're not gonna get the drainage that you need and you're not gonna get the root production, the top growth, and therefore the healing that you want on the plant in an expedited fashion. Whereas if you put it in a porous mix, you're gonna get all of those things. So first things first, we need to make the wound either concave, flat, or convex, depending on the species that you're working with. So all of this is gonna be dictated by the thickness of the tissue of that particular species. So in the case of a Japanese maple, the tissue is actually relatively thin. So if we were to do a concave cut on a Japanese maple, that tissue is then going to heal concave and you're always going to be able to see where that wound was. So what we wanna do on a Japanese maple is actually make the wound flat. So you can take your concave cutters, for example, you know, carve into it a little bit. You wanna be able to run your finger over the wound and make it feel seamless with the bark around it. So you may even need to take a razor blade or a knife and smooth that wound out a little bit, but you should be able to run your thumb over that wound to feel that it's you know, nice and smooth. That's going to provide you with a nice flat healed cut over the course of two, three, four, five years, depending on how big the actual wound was to begin with. Now, if you're dealing with something like a trident maple, for example, the tissue on those is very thick. So you're gonna to wanna to make that wound concave. If you're dealing with an azalea, you may wanna make that wound almost convex because the tissue is incredibly thin on azaleas. So each species is gonna be slightly different and you need to address each individual species to see if that wound needs to be concave, flat, or convex. Now, once you've created the wound on the tree, what you wanna do obviously is cover that with cut paste. I tend to use a putty type cut paste here, which works quite well. Now you're gonna to start to see a little bit of callusing on these trees. And again, we're doing these major cutbacks on these trees and creating major wounds in May. So you're gonna put the cut paste on, you're gonna see that callusing starting to form over the course of the growing season. Typically by about late July, early August or so, you can take that cut paste off and actually see the callus formation on the tree. Most calluses will move in a little bit and then stop. So you actually have to reactivate the tissue by taking a knife and scoring the interior of that callus and then reapplying cut paste over the fresh wound. It's going to reactivate the tissue and cause the callus to continue to heal over the course of the remainder of the growing season. And then the following spring, you'll have to repeat the same process. So in a given growing season, you'll need to score that callus anywhere from two to three times, typically, depending on how long your growing season is. So the second thing you need to do to expedite wound closure is allow some of the terminal buds on the tree to elongate unimpeded. You don't want to cut them back. So for example, we've got several down here that we're allowing to elongate. We've got some of the terminal shoots up at the top that we're allowing to elongate. What that does is it actually moves 
removes those hormones that we talked about with the crosstalk earlier in this tutorial, the auxin and the cytokinin, more rapidly uh, and in greater quantities up and down the trunk. That's going to help expedite the healing of large wounds on your broadleaf evergreen and deciduous trees. So this tree, we're gonna allow this growth to elongate for the remainder of this growing season. I'm gonna cut it back once we go into the dormant season. This is a pretty mild cutback, so doing this type of cutback in late fall, early winter, not a problem, it's not gonna create large wounds, but we are gonna cut these longer shoots back once the tree goes dormant. And then next spring, we're gonna repeat the process again. We're going to score the wounds again in the spring, put cut paste on them, let everything elongate again, and then score the wounds again two or three times over the course of the remainder of the growing season. So hopefully that answers some of your questions on how to heal large wounds on trees, but this is just a natural process of working with broadleaf evergreen and deciduous trees. Okay, so as we move further into the growing season, what should you be doing in terms of fungicide and pesticide? Well, here I tend to like to spray preventively rather than in reaction to those things emerging on my trees. So once that first flush of growth has completely hardened off in late spring going into early summer, I switch away from the granular systemics and actually start applying topical sprays. So I try to get on just a very basic schedule. So essentially here, you know, by about May 1st, most of our deciduous trees, the leaves have hardened off by that point. So on May 1st, what I'll typically do is spray a pesticide on the foliage of all of our deciduous trees. As a matter of fact, I spray it on basically everything in the nursery, including our conifers. And my go-to pesticide is malathion. You can pick it up, I think Spectricide is a company that makes it, but you can get it at Lowe's and Home Depot. And it takes care of pretty much everything that's going to affect most of your bonsai species. Now, I'll do that, like I said, on May 1st, and then one month later, on June 1st, I'll switch over to a fungicide. Now, the fungicides that I tend to use here would be something like a Clearys 3336, which is systemic, but I spray it on the foliage, or I'll use the spray version of Infuse. Either or is totally fine. Once I get to the first of the next month, I'll switch back over to the pesticide, then the following month back to the fungicide, and I'll continue to alternate through the rest of the growing season. This tends to keep pretty much everything we have here on track and keeps most pests and diseases at bay for the entire growing season. Now, that being said, you may come across a certain pest or disease that whatever you're spraying for doesn't cover. So you may have to spray a specific type of fungicide or a specific type of pesticide to take care of a certain pest or disease as it emerges over the growing season. But as a general rule of thumb, if you're spraying preventively once per month, alternating months between your fungicide and pesticide, that should keep you on track for the growing season. All right, what kind of questions you guys got? Let's see here. Uh, all right, we got a couple in the chat. So I'll answer those first while you guys are thinking of things to ask. So uh, let's see, Duncan says, um, is there an ideal age to repot a Japanese maple from garden soil in a grow pot to bonsai mix in a bonsai or training pot? Um, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily a, an age issue. Uh, although the older the tree gets, the more gentle you're gonna have to be with the root system of the plant. Um, it also depends, you know, if you're, you said here, you've got it in garden soil and a grow pot. Um, so, you know, switching out from a grow pot over to bonsai soil in a bonsai pot is not going to be that difficult to do. Uh, as a matter of fact, you can probably uh, essentially bare root the tree as long as it's not a very, very old tree. Um, and you can do that in, in one shot, typically. Now, if it's a very, very pot bound Japanese maple in a grow pot, you know, with garden soil, you might have to phase out the garden soil over two or three growing seasons, depending on how bad the situation is. Um, but for the most part, you should be able to bare root them within one to two growing seasons and get them into, you know, the proper bone type mix, uh, you know, essentially throughout the entire root system of the tree. If you're dealing with a tree, though, that's in the garden or that's planted in the ground, that's going to be a little bit more difficult. Um, so, you know, you're going to have to transition it to uh, ideally what you'd want to do is transition it into a training pot with bonsai mix, but not bare root the tree when you first collect it. You're gonna to wanna to leave as much of the sort of field soil or at least the core of the field soil up underneath the trunk as you possibly can, uh, just working the roots out around the periphery and then replacing that soil with actual bonsai soil. So again, it's gonna be at least probably two, three, four uh, growing seasons before you can fully phase out the field soil and totally replace it with bonsai soil. Um, so it's less of an age issue, really, and more of a, a situational issue, depending on the, uh, you know, how compact the root system is and the type of soil that it was growing in to start with.
Uh, let's see here from Oscar uh, for trees like the trident maple that will be defoliated multiple times in a year. Uh, would you still give fertilizer in spring? So no, I, I would not recommend that you give fertilizer in the spring. Uh, even if you're going to be defoliating those trees in uh, May or early June, for example. And the reason being is that if you fertilize in the spring, you're going to get extremely long internodes on those plants and large leaves. But, you know, when you defoliate, obviously the second flush of growth is going to be smaller leaves, but the original elongated internodes that you created on the tree are still going to be there even if you defoliate. So I recommend that you hold off on all fertilization in the spring, even if you're going to defoliate those trees. And then, like I said in the video, wait until the final flush of growth after the final defoliation has come out, hardened off, and then fertilize at that point. Uh, I didn't mention it in the video, but you should not be defoliating any tree unless it's very, very healthy and throwing elongating shoots. If you're working with a trident maple and you notice that it, it came out with good growth in the spring, but there's no elongating shoot, you know, there's no, uh, let's say at least three or four pairs of leaves along that shoot by the time you get to May, I recommend that you don't defoliate it. It's not strong enough and it's probably not gonna respond well to defoliation. Uh, so definitely keep that in mind too. Uh, let's see, Rich here says, uh, in the discussion of wound closure, it looked like you didn't cover the entire wound with cut paste, only the ring of bark around the uh, wound. Is this correct? Uh, yes, that was correct with that particular tree because the wound is so large uh, on that plant to cover the whole thing with cut paste is kind of, it, it's a waste and it's kind of arbitrary at that point because the wound around the edge is only going to, callus over so much uh, each time before you have to reactivate the tissue. So it's kind of pointless to cover uh, the entire thing. So I would just uh, basically, you know, take little pieces and kind of stick it around the edge or take an, a, a bigger chunk and kind of roll it out uh, and make it very elongated and then stick that around the outer edge of the wound and kind of press it into place. Either one of those would be fine. Um, let's see, Rich also says uh, part two of the same question, is the technique the same for coniferous trees? Uh, typically with conifers, um, it depends on the species, but as a general rule of thumb, uh, I, I sort of got this mantra from uh, Warren Hill, who is my first bonsai teacher. Uh, he said, gin everything. So on, on my conifers, you know, if it's a branch that needs to be removed, I will turn it into a gin to start with. Um, and then depending on the situation, if I do want that wound to close, I'll treat it slightly differently. So for example, if I'm dealing with a Japanese black pine, if I want to make a large wound on a Japanese black pine and I want to make that wound heal over over time, what I don't want to do is bite into the tissue of the tree like I showed you on the Japanese maple or on a trident maple. What you want to do is actually create a small gin, like a small nub. Uh, it's kind of hard for me to show here. So let's just say this is, this is the wound here, right? What you want to do is leave a small gin sticking out on one side of that wound. And then over time, what you want to do as the wound starts to callus up around the base of that gin, you want to go in and actually carve out around the base of the gin and make it thinner and thinner and thinner. And that wound will heal over little by little towards the center. The reason why you want to leave that gin though out beyond the wound is so that it continues to pull sap beyond the live tissue around the base of that wound. So if you were to cut it flush, it's not pulling sap beyond there and it's likely to dry out around the outer ring and it's not going to heal over. So does that make sense? It's kind of hard to it, uh, it, illustrate with my hands so. it makes it makes sense with, uh, except for one piece of it if you sure. make a gin, if you make a gin out of it you've removed the uh the tissue that's used for transportation of the sap uh, what, what's going to pull the sap if you've completely removed the bark around the gin that's an awesome question so the xylem of the tree is actually also uh it pulling up essentially water from the base of the plant uh, so when you're making a gin, you're taking off the bark, you're taking off the next layer would be the phloem, then the cambium, and then you're going down to the hardwood, which is essentially the xylem underneath it. So it's still going to be pulling water up from the base of the tree, and there's still going to be essentially sap flow emerging from that. So that, that's exactly what it is. So that's a perfectly legitimate question. If you're taking the gin all the way back to the core heartwood, you're not, I mean, that's obviously dead. That's dead yeah. wood in the interior. So you definitely want to leave the xylem, but when you're creating gins, you're almost always going to be leaving some of the xylem, particularly when you're making them you know, out of branches. Branches that we tend to turn into gins aren't so old that they necessarily have that heartwood that's dead right in the center. Um, so it's mostly live xylem that just hasn't died off entirely. So that's a really good question though. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let's see here. Uh, next question is from Joshua. He says, have you had any success with neem oil? I'm trying to keep things natural, but neem oil seems to not be very effective. Uh, maybe for overwintering when pests are less active. 
Yeah, I, I haven't used neem oil. Um, you know, we, like I said before, we've got so many trees here and a lot of expensive stuff. I, I spray the heaviest chemicals I can possibly uh, buy without having to get full on certification. Um, so, you know, in the winter, what I use for a dormant spray is uh, just lime sulfur. So I don't know if you would consider that, uh, you know, a bit more of a natural approach uh, or not, but uh, I use lime sulfur as a spray and I usually use it at a ratio of anywhere from three tablespoons per gallon up to about uh, seven or eight tablespoons per gallon, depending on uh, the situation. So um, I noticed that last spring we had a bit of an issue in the spring with uh, fungal problems. And that was because we had such a mild winter last year. Um, and I only sprayed with three tablespoons per gallon uh, and when I say last year, we're talking like 2020, uh, I sprayed in 2019 in December. Um, so I sprayed with three table, tablespoons per gallon in December of 2019. And then in March of 2020, we had a lot of fungal problems because it was such a mild winter. It didn't kill off a lot of the, the fungal uh, issues within the soil and within the plants. So this year, just for safety's sake, I upped it to, I think we did seven tablespoons per gallon uh, of lime sulfur to water. Um, and it didn't really turn the trees a whitish color like you would think it might, uh, but I think, or I'm hoping we'll have more success this spring with less fungal problems as the uh, temperatures start to rise above about 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, let's see here. Uh, next one's from Mike. Uh, Mike says, for ficus, how should you shape the cut uh, slash wound to help it heal in a natural way, flat, concave, convex, or concave? Um, so I don't work with ficus at all, uh, so I don't want to, you know, give you the wrong answer. I would assume that the tissue on ficus is relatively thin, um, so I would probably assume you'd treat it similarly to a Japanese maple, so essentially flat, uh, but I'm not an expert on ficus, so I, I'll uh, defer to somebody else for, for that. If there's somebody in the, the audience here who knows more about ficus, feel free to chime in. Bjorn, I would ask you a question. It's kind of a theme that's running around with some of the members of the club. So how would you treat through the first year seedlings or other bare root stock that you might order in the spring and it arrives in March? What, what would you do in terms of substrate fertilization and so forth through that first year to really get it uh, settled and solid? Yeah, I, I would recommend for the most part, uh, you know, with bare root seedlings, putting them in something that's uh, relatively heav heavy organic that's going to hold quite a bit of moisture. Uh, I think it would be less shock for the plants if you do that. Uh, you know, so just your general potting mix, for example, uh, even a miracle Grow potting mix that already has fertilizer in it would be totally fine. Uh, and you may want to leave it in that for a full two years just to totally get acclimated and then switch it over to uh, you know, something like pure Akadama or the Aoki blend that I mentioned before. Um, and at that stage, you can start, it should have enough roots on it at that point, you can cut most of the tap root off uh, and start working with the peripheral roots and creating a, a better Nabari on the tree. So uh, you know, don't rush it with the seedlings right from the start and don't be totally averse to putting them in a potting mix either. Cool. All right, any other questions before we? Move on to the fall section. Okay, um, the fall section, oh, uh, let's see. I've got one more question here uh, from Rich. He says, is Aoki blend uh, still available? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, I don't sell it directly from my nursery here. Uh, eventually we'll probably do that, but you can buy it from uh, like Jonas Dupuy from uh, Bonsai Tonight in California uh, or the Bonsai Learning Center in uh, North Carolina. I believe they ship it as well. Um, so yeah, definitely check with, uh, with those two sources. They should have it available. Okay, all right, I'm gonna share my screen again here. This uh, next section, the fall section is relatively short, um, but it'll kind of tie up some loose ends and then we can uh, do one more Q and A session at the end there, so. All right, this brings us to our fall maintenance section here for broadleaf evergreen and deciduous species. Now we're gonna be talking here about fertilization, pruning, and then what happens to the trees as they start to go into dormancy, into late fall and early winter. So first things first here, let's talk about fertilization in the fall. Now there are some myths out there that are floating around in the ether, on the interwebs, and in books that say you should never use a high nitrogen fertilizer in the fall. So you should be using something like a 0-10-10 rather than a 10-10-10. Uh, 
So this comes from the idea that nitrogen is going to produce elongating growth on the tree and it may not harden off by the time the tree goes dormant in late fall or early winter. So you may get tremendous dieback on the tree. Well, what you need to understand is that nitrogen does not induce bud break on any tree, whether that's a coniferous piece of material or deciduous or broadleaf evergreen. It does not induce bud break. It doesn't cause the buds that are dormant there to open up and elongate. What causes those buds to open up and elongate is pruning. So what you need to keep in mind here is as you're getting into late, late summer, early, early fall, the new buds for the next spring have already set up by that time of year, basically. So if you were to go back and start pruning on your deciduous trees, say in September, October, maybe even in November, if you prune those trees back at that time, that is going to induce bud break on those trees. So you don't want to induce that bud break for obvious reasons. Again, buds break, they pop open, they start to elongate, produce new fleshy growth. That growth doesn't harden off by the time you get to the first frost and you get tremendous dieback on your broadleaf evergreen and deciduous trees. So the moral of the story here is don't prune at that time of year, but you should be fertilizing with a high nitrogen fertilizer. So again, here we're using Grow Power, which is a 1288. Again, it's got a lot of really nice micronutrients in it as well. So we're using that fertilizer all fall season with the intention of pumping up the nutrient base that's in the soil. So by the time the tree gets to the following spring, we're not gonna be fertilizing in the spring, but it has that nutrient base there to produce a good solid flush of growth in the early spring. So putting on a 0 10, 10 in the fall is an absolute myth. You can use a high nitrogen fertilizer. You just gotta be aware that pruning in the fall season is a terrible idea. You wanna wait until the tree goes completely dormant, late fall, early winter basically, drops all of its leaves through the process of abscission, goes completely dormant, and then you can do like a silhouette refinement or a slight cutback at that time of year. But again, you don't wanna be doing massive heavy cuts in the late fall, early winter because big wounds on the tree aren't going to heal over the course of the winter. You could get even more dieback at large wound sites uh, and you could run into major problems come the next year. So light pruning, you know, once the tree goes completely dormant, it's totally fine. No pruning during the fall season as the tree is starting to go into dormancy, you should be A-OK. -okay. And again, fertilize with your regular old heavy nitrogen fertilizer, not a problem at all. Okay, so as we start getting into the fall season, you're gonna notice that most of your deciduous trees are going to start to change color. That's essentially the chlorophyll from the leaves being reabsorbed into the plant, or at least the nutrients from the chlorophyll. And they're being reabsorbed as essentially a way to create an antifreeze or protection for the cellular structures of the trees going into winter dormancy. At this stage, once the leaves start to fall off, I would recommend going ahead and actually removing those leaves. It's gonna help keep your garden a little bit cleaner. You know, when we're dealing with a lot of deciduous trees like what we have here at ASAN, if we let all of them fall on the ground, it just creates a giant mess here that we have to clean up. So the best thing for us anyway, is to go through and actually remove all of those leaves as we move into late fall going into early winter. Okay, so the last thing I wanna talk about here is the fungicide and pesticide regimen as the trees go dormant in late fall going into winter. And essentially what I do here, not only for our broadleaf evergreen and deciduous trees, but also for our conifers as well, is I spray everything with lime sulfur. Now you can use anywhere from two tablespoons to about five tablespoons per gallon when you spray. I tend to stick with about three. That seems to take care of pretty much all the diseases, all the pests going into winter, but it doesn't turn my trees that stark white color. So if you don't want your trees to turn that white color, I would recommend about a three tablespoon per gallon ratio. Now, of course, I recommend that you make sure everything has gone completely dormant before you spray the lime sulfur. But again, that should take care of you for the rest of the winter going into early spring. And then you can repeat this whole process all over again. Okay, I know that that was a ton of information jammed into a very small demonstration here, but again, like I said at the very beginning, my goal was to give you kind of a basic schedule through the growing season to keep your broadleaf evergreen and deciduous trees on track. There's a whole lot more detail that we could get into in terms of the technique, but you know, like I said, this is just a basic overview so that you guys can keep your broadleaf evergreen and deciduous trees progressing forward in a positive direction year after year after year. So I want to thank you guys so much for checking out this episode and I look forward to hearing all of your questions. Till next time, take care. So I got a question about um, the dormant spray. So the, uh, uh, the mixture that you're using, you're using that on your deciduous and your conifers? Everything. Okay, and also um, say like on your conifers and your pines, are you spraying like the foliage as well?
Yep, spraying the foliage, spraying the trunks, uh, everything. And I don't worry about the lime sulfur getting into the root system of the tree. Uh, we use a you know a big backpack sprayer essentially. Uh, uh -huh. When you're spraying the fine mist on the foliage, obviously we want it to soak the foliage or at least coat the entire tree. Um, but it's not going to be so heavy that it's going to be drenching the, the soil of the plants and potentially killing the tree. So you don't have to worry about covering the pots. Uh, you don't have to worry about the tree. You don't have to worry about the pots turning white either if you're using that ratio. Uh, and as you can see in the video, I said a little bit lower ratio than I mentioned earlier, but I've since bumped it up to like three to seven uh, tablespoons per gallon. Uh, depending on on your situation. Okay, and th and, th and that's actually good that you brought it up because um, I've had an issue once where with neem oil, where you know I tried to saturate the tree, top, bottom, the leaves, and everything. Well, a bunch of it got into the soil. The plant looked fine for a while, but once I went to go water, it started to die. Um, so the neem oil getting into the soil killed off the plant. <laughs> Gotcha. Okay. I, I see behind you too. Looks like you got a lot of ficus and, and indoor plants there. Um, yeah, this is just part of it, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I definitely recommend you don't spray lime sulfur on those guys. <laughs> oh yeah. No, these ones, these okay. ones are a totally different animal. <laughs> gotcha. Okay, cool. Yeah. Just wanted to clarify. All right. What other kind of question you guys got? I got one. All right. So the defoliating of the leaves that have turned, are there any species that you need to wait like late into winter to make sure that that leaf is like super crispy or it can, is it kind of like a, a second defoliation? It doesn't really matter when, as long as it's turned its color. Yeah, as long as it's turned its color and it, and it kind of is easy to pull off by hand. You know, if you, if you really have to tug on it, uh, I would wait to, to cut those leaves off. Uh, another thing to consider too is, uh, you know, if you're dealing with like beech, for example, or hornbeams, uh, even if the tree has completely changed color and it's obvious that it's dormant, even if you pull the leaves on those, sometimes they won't come off. If you're pulling directly towards you, what you want to do in that instance is push the leaf away back in towards the tree and it'll pop the petiole off very, very easily. Um, so yeah, as a general rule of thumb, it should be easy to pull most leaves off. And at that point you can go ahead and just take them off. Um, and again, that's mainly just for cleanliness purposes. Uh, but you know, with your hornbeams and your beaches, you definitely need to push them back the opposite direction. Okay. Uh, Bjorn, same, same, uh, topic and very, very small leaves, Kotohime, maple, mm -hmm. Yatsubusa, uh, cutting each one of those off would make my, make me blind. Sure. Uh, is it just strictly a maintenance issue? So you don't have so much to clean up or is there actually a, a, a um, botanical uh, purpose for doing that? Well, so it, it depends on who you ask. Uh, they'll give you different answers. So for example, my, my Oyakata, my teacher in Japan, he would have us in the fall as the leaves started to change color, start removing uh, leaves on say, for example, the stronger sections of the Japanese maple, like the outer canopy and leaving the leaves on the inner canopy. Uh, in his uh, mind, it was redirecting energy one more time back to the interior of the plant. Uh, I've asked other people about it or heard other people give lectures about the leaf uh, as it starts to change color in the fall. Once it gets to a certain point, uh, I've heard it described as becoming like a carbon sink for the tree and potentially weakening the tree if you leave the leaves on it. I have seen no uh, actual uh, research though to indicate that that's actually the case i think that was just some other professionals talking out of their rear end um, so what i've concluded is that it you don't really get any different effect within the tree health-wise if you remove the leaf or don't remove the leaf so it's really to me just a cleanliness issue okay i have a feeling that fujikawa-san made us do that and told us that so that we would do it with more uh, more fervor, I guess, and be more enthusiastic about it because it was part of the development of the tree. Uh, but I, I have a feeling it was mostly just to keep the nursery clean. So that's just what I tell people at this point. Okay. I appreciate that. Thanks. <laughs> oh, and by, by the way, with uh, your Japanese maples like that, that have the really tiny leaves, I've got quite a few of them here as well. Uh, what I'll actually do is use a leaf blower on the lowest setting and just blow the leaves off. <laughs> <laughs> it saves a lot of time. <laughs> Good idea. Yeah, yeah, as long as you don't turn it up super high, you should be all right. Right, right. All right, let's see. There's another couple more questions here in the chat. Um, from Graham, it says, do you ever spray uh, permethrin on Yamadori conifers to prevent against bark borers? I have not done that. Um, I have a couple of clients who have done it and say that it works quite well. Uh, 
I tend to prefer just to use the imidacloprid though that I mentioned at the beginning of spring. Um, you know, you can get it in the granular form or you can get it in a spray form, but it's, it's systemic and it's designed to take care of bores. The only problem with imidacloprid is that it kills bees. So if you have a bee population in your area, you gotta be extra careful. I would recommend only using the uh, granular version rather than the spray version. Uh, so at least it's not carried away in the air and potentially affecting bee populations. Um, so, you know, it will kill wasps as well. So uh, if you've got a wasp problem, uh, we noticed this spring that when the wasps started coming out after we put the imidacloprid on, it killed them all almost instantly. So uh, that could be beneficial, but no, I haven't used permethrin myself. Uh, let's see here from Mike. Uh, do you ever cut leaves to make them smaller as a technique, uh, say to help balance the energy across the tree instead of uh, cutting them at the petiole uh, on which species or in which situations? Yes. Uh, I didn't mention this in the video, but on uh, deciduous material and broadleaf evergreen trees as well that cannot be defoliated, say, for example, you know, it's like a Japanese maple. I don't recommend you defoliate that or like a beech or a really old trident maple that's unhealthy that you can't really defoliate. Uh, what you can do with the leaves on those plants after they harden off is fold them, uh, lightly cut them in half on a backwards angle, uh, essentially removing about 50% of the surface volume or surface area rather of the leaf. That will allow more light to penetrate to the interior of the tree. Because you've removed 50% of that photosynthetic surface as well, it's producing less food for that particular branch that it's attached to. So it's going to weaken it to some degree. So it's a way that you can possibly balance energy as well. Uh, so say for example, you're dealing with a, uh, an Arakawa Japanese maple. They notoriously have weak apexes that tend to die spontaneously. So one way you can keep uh, the apexes alive and healthy on those trees for a longer period of time is by leaving all of the leaves on the apex of the tree, but on the lower branches of the tree, you can remove one leaf in each pair and then take the remaining leaf and cut that leaf in half. So you've essentially removed like 75% of the surface area of foliage on the bottom portion of the tree relative to the top of the tree. Um, so yes, absolutely, you can do that. Um, again, beech, I would recommend doing that with anything that you can't defoliate. It's a good technique um, to get light to the interior and to balance energy as well. All right. Uh, did that, hopefully that answered that question. Okay. Uh, what else you guys got? Uh, I'm sorry. Thing I've heard, Bjorn, is that for any of the pesticides that kill bees, it's best to hold off on applying them until after the particular plant flowers. So... You know, you're not that seems like good advice. Yeah. going in and getting nectar. Yeah, that seems like very good advice. Uh, yeah, so depending on, on what you, you're working with, uh, I would definitely recommend yeah. sort of following that, that uh, advice for sure. Something perhaps a little off topic. Sure. Um, do you, I, I have more conifers than broadleaf evergreens. Sure. Uh, so my questions are focused there. Uh, I have a I have a mature uh, Norway spruce, Pisces abies gregoriana, and I want to push the growth inside. It's a mature tree. Can I continue to cut the, you know, like half of the outer foliages? Uh, will it continue to to break back uh, some interior foliage? Yeah, I doubt it's going to break back uh, on old wood, um, you know, but within the branches that still have uh, some flexibility to them uh, and that haven't barked up, it is still possible to produce some back budding on those. Um, what I recommend is that you allow the tree to flush out in spring and then you either pinch back the areas that you want to keep a little bit longer and that will likely produce some back budding uh, or you cut back heavily in certain areas to produce further back budding on the tree that's one way you can do it. The second thing I recommend you do with your spruce is actually bend the branches with wire without raffia. Bending the branches on your spruce uh, will create micro tears in the branch that often will cause the tree to force back budding, even on older wood. Um, and this is especially true when you're dealing with like uh, Colorado blue spruce, like out where you guys are. Um, so for example, if you do, really you can do it just about any time of year, but I recommend doing most of your heavy bending on, on most of your conifers, including your spruces in the fall. If you do it in the fall, the next spring, at some point, it may not be at the very beginning of spring, maybe mid spring or late spring, you should start to see the formation of some buds at that point. 
Uh, and they may not flush out that year, maybe the next year before they actually produce foliage on them. So they're just essentially uh, uh, not needle buds, but uh, adventitious buds. Um, so you'll see those form at that time of year. And then the next year you should get some actual foliage production in those areas. So uh, in, in any case, if you can avoid putting raffia on the branches of your spruce, that way it keeps all that tissue open and available. So it can actually put out uh, budding. I recommend that you do that. Yeah, it's got some good um, exfoliating bark. Should I try to help it a little bit by pulling off a fingernail size piece of bark? I don't, I don't know if that would necessarily work. Um, okay. I, I would try, you know, bending the branches. Uh, yeah. I, I don't recommend you know, bend them back and forth. You do it right. <laughs> bend right. them once. Um, and it's going to be on the tensile side. So the stretch side of the branch where those micro tears will occur and you're like, likely to get back putting in those areas. Okay, great. Thank you. Cool. All right. What else we got here? It looks like it for the uh, for the chat. If anyone else has any other questions, just in the chat or up. Oh, there's another. Ah, okay. Uh, any advice for developing a Mikawa Yatsubusa? Uh, I purchased one from a nursery this past fall. I've heard that they can be challenging and are prone to congestion. Um, okay. So is this a Mikawa Yatsubusa uh, black pine or is this Mikawa Yatsubusa maple? Uh, what are we referring to? Let's see, uh, maple, okay, cool. Um, yes, okay, so anytime you're dealing with a dwarf cultivar of Japanese maple, uh, you know, this could be like your Mikawa Yatsubusa here or uh, Kotohime, Kiyohime, uh, Shishigashira. For example, they're all going to be prone to congestion within the branches and that's because the inner nodes are so small. So what I recommend you do with those uh, species is Allow them to elongate in the spring. Don't pinch back to the first pair of leaves. Just let them elongate. Once the new growth has started to harden off, I recommend that you pinch back to the second pair of leaves and remove the first pair. So essentially you've elongated the inner node by one set of leaves. If you do this year after year, it's going to allow you to produce a bit more uh, sort of a, a sinuous line within the branches and less of that fist type look to your branch tips. Whereas if you pinch back to the first pair, it's going to end up looking like little fists. So hopefully, hopefully that helps. Um, so uh, Colin says, uh, what is the best way to thicken the trunk of nursery stock? I uh, keep them in nursery pots with garden soil, transfer to a wooden box with bonsai soil or plant in the garden on top of a tile. Okay. So my recommendation is that you avoid planting your trees in the ground to thicken the trunks. Uh, they tend to get away from you uh, if you have them in the ground. Uh, they tend to grow a little bit too quickly and you inevitably have to trunk chop those trees, which means you're going to end up with major scars on those trunks. So what I recommend is you try to keep them in either net pots, uh, colanders, or wooden box, or even nursery pots for the duration of the life of the tree and develop it a bit more slowly. Uh, you know, for me personally, the goal with most of the deciduous trees, particularly smooth bark deciduous trees, like your maples, your hornbeams, um, plants like that, stewardia, for example, is to develop them with no scarring on the trunk. It's very, very difficult to do. Um, so you're only going to be able to do that with trees maintained in containers. Um, so to answer your question specifically here, though, as to how to thicken the trunk, um, it doesn't matter what type of pot really you have them in. You could have them in the nursery pot. You could have them in a wooden box or in uh, um, you know, a colander or something like that. Uh, what you want to let happen is the terminal shoot at the top of the tree, one terminal shoot elongate and let it grow for one growing season or five growing seasons or 10 growing seasons, however long you want it to grow to get the, the desired thickness to the trunk. Um, at some point, you are going to have to chop it down a little bit. So you have to be strategic about it. You don't want the wound to be bigger than maybe two inches in diameter because it's going to be hard to heal. So once you get the trunk, you know, to a certain point uh, and you know that that wound's going to be a two inch wound, cut it back, regrow new apex, let it elongate again, then, then cut that one when it gets to a, a two inch diameter, for example. And doing that year after year, you're going to thicken the trunk. So just allow the terminal shoot at the top to grow. And that's going to produce uh, a much thicker trunk on your tree. Uh, let's see. I have an Acer Tatiana. Uh, does your comment apply to that? I don't know. Um, I've not worked with Acer Tatiana, so I, I don't want to give you bad advice. Um, if the inner nodes are really, really tiny on that, though, uh, the technique would be the same as working with, you know, like the Kotohime, Kiyohime, 
um, or Mikawa Yatsubusa, for example. So I, I've got a kind of a question following on the thickening of the trunk as well. Um, sure. So, I mean, letting the, the terminal or the apex grow um, is, is good. I haven't tried that yet. Um, but I've been watching a lot of videos where supposedly keeping a more a radial root base will help it also flare out. Is, is that true or? Yes. Yeah, that's absolutely true as well. Um, so if, if you're just wanting to thicken the trunk, Allowing the apex to grow, uh, allowing the terminal shoot to grow is what's going to thicken the trunk. If you want to create a radial flare to the nabari, a more outward spread to the nabari, the shallower the pot you want to put it in. So the trouble is, is kind of finding a balance here. If you put it in a pot that's very, very shallow and you let the terminal shoot on the top of the tree grow, it's not likely to thicken the trunk very much because the trees are wanting to put their roots down into the ground. So what I recommend is if you want to thicken the trunk, do that first for a number of years, allow the terminal shoot to plant it in a relatively deep pot, like a, a typical uh, garden, a plastic garden container or a colander. Once you get the trunk to the desired thickness, then start working on that flare to the nabari. If on the other hand, you want to create that crazy flaring nabari with really thin trunks, start out by putting it in a very shallow container and only maintain it in that container. So it all depends on kind of your desired goal aesthetically with that tree. Uh, my preference for the most part is to, is to try to develop a flat kind of uh, nabari to the plant and not worry too much about the thickening of the trunks. That will happen naturally a little bit over time uh, as the tree puts on more and more tissue uh, ar around itself or you know, as it starts to naturally grow out. Uh, so, you know, I, I would recommend focusing a bit more on the nabari development, particularly with Japanese maples planting them in a wooden container, for example, uh, that's relatively shallow um, and potentially even grafting roots to those plants as well to create that radio structure. So does that make sense? Um, yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Okay, cool. I got one, one more in that same vein. Sure. If your terminal ends up not being in a place that you wanted it, like it's, sure. it's too low and then you only got a little teeny tiny one up top where you do want it, is there anything you can do there? Can you take off the big one and in hopes that the little one will take over? Yeah, you can do that. Um, you know, most of the plants that we deal with are apically dominant. So, you know, typically the highest point on the tree is going to be your strongest growing point, but that is not always the case. Uh, so you can remove that lower branch that has taken over as the apex and it should redirect energy to the highest point on the plant. It may not do it in the same growing season that you cut back that lower branch though. It may be a delayed effect and then the following year you might get much better top growth on that true terminal shoot at the very top of the tree. Okay. So short of that, there's not much you can do <laughs> for the most part. <laughs> Thanks. Sure. Uh, there's another one from uh, Rich here in the chat. It says, when removing a branch from the trunk, what is the orientation of the concave cutter? Uh, is the vertical orientation preferable or does it not matter? It doesn't really matter uh, what the orientation is. It's however you can get your hand into the tree to you know, either make it flat, concave, or you know, like I said, slightly convex, depending on the situation. Um, so yeah, don't worry too much about how you get your hand in there. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Yeah, I can, so... There's one last question from Dan, just, and I would like to hear the answer. Do you have a favorite Japanese maple variety? Favorite Japanese maple variety. Ah, uh, the one that Dan mentioned earlier, Sagan, is probably one of my favorites. Either that or Benichi Dori. Um, they both come out just beautifully red in the spring. Um, Benichi Dori is more like a pinkish color. But, uh, you know, there, there are only a handful of really good examples of either of those cultivars uh, in Japan that I've ever seen. Uh, but when, you know, when they're good, they're good. They're incredible trees. Mm -hmm.